Hey, get ready for a brand new episode of Mistake Free Real Estate Podcast, co-branded with Rise Up Live Free Audience. Jimmy Vreeland and I are going to go deep on what we learned from our latest Collective Genius Mastermind event in San Diego. Check out this episode. You're going to love it. Everybody, welcome to another edition of the Mistake Free Real Estate and the Rise Up Live Free podcast. Jimmy and I, as you know, always come back from our Collective Genius Mastermind event, and we love to download our thoughts on what's happening in the marketplace. It gives us a good opportunity to connect with our investors and our audience uh, to let them know what we're hearing from all of the best players in the market. Jimmy, welcome to the show, buddy. Hey, Mark, how's it going? It's going great. Hey, since uh, you uh, since we did our last show, you've been to Guatemala. In fact, you were down there with my children, who got to go experience that. How was the trip? Uh, it was awesome. Um, me and Jackson, we we just we built a concrete floor for our family down there. Wow! And it, your boy, he's a workhorse. Like you should have seen this guy. It was. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm a competitive guy and I'm like, oh, I can't, I can't let this 17 year old out shovel me. So we had a fun little competition there, but had a ton of fun, uh, with Aubrey and Jackson. Appreciate that. No, they, I mean, it's a life changing, uh, trip for them too. It was Aubrey's second time and she's already, uh, heading me up to, to go down for a third. So amazing what Brett, Brett Snodgrass and Cinda and Jim Rocker are doing down there with, um, with that charity. If anyone has, uh, interest in, in going down. Um, there's trips in June and July, I believe of this year. And, uh, the collective genius, we should probably pause for a minute and say part of the big mission of Jason Medley, the founder is always to promote, um, giving back. Um, he's a massive go giver himself. The generous genius is a division of the collective genius and, and loves to, um, not only just promote the, the giving and tithing, but also the active participation in charitable endeavors. And that's where Guatemala and also the Mexican uh, mission trips have come in. And Jimmy, you've been a big part of that. That's a part of your your family lifestyle now, right? Our holiday season starts with a uh, trip down to Ensenada uh, to go uh, build houses. It is, uh, I, uh, I'm i grateful to Jason and Collective Genius for a ton of things. But opening up that opportunity for me and my family has been uh, life-changing. Well, agreed. And um, yeah, couldn't couldn't agree more. He's a hell of an individual and uh, one of my great mates. Um, hey, takeaways from CG. Let's hit it um, from the top. I know we've got a lot of, we'll, we'll do our CG takeaways, but I also want to hit on banking, inflation, um, the market, um, how the middle class is getting crushed. I know you recently heard from a podcast that we want to hit on about why the middle class is absolutely getting crushed with our current market. Um, but let's start. What, uh, Collective Genius, um, first of all, um, congratulations. I know you were recently... Um, you know, a big part of the, the, um, select group, but also you were, um, a facilitator on this most recent event. So, um, I know you delivered massive value. What were your big takeaways? Um, you know, big takeaways this quarter is just, we're going into a, a stabilizing market and I've been reading a ton of Jim Collins, uh, lately, uh, good to great, uh, great by choice, great by choice. I love that book, but he talks about productive paranoia. So mm. it was our obligation as business owners, Q3, Q4, to envision worst case scenarios. Yes. Right. Uh, but we all, we all did that. And uh, the great, I, I thought the great thing about this meeting was none of those worst case scenarios occur. Like black swan events happen. I'm not saying ever, you know, everything's great right now. I'm just saying, it's a very stabilizing market. And then our market in St. Louis has taken off. Like if we put anything on the MLS, it's selling. Hot. Completely. Where do you guys see it? I, I want to get to the market because we're seeing a super hot market and we'll certainly get to that. Um, my takeaways from CG um, was that the supply of inventory is really controlling what is becoming a hot market. Um, so I had two kind of deep conversations with two of the people that I trust, one from Boston, one from California recently at CG. And, and they were both, you know, elder statesmen who I always look to, to, to kind of, you know, talk about what, you know, Hey, I'm looking at doing this or I'm looking at doing that. And, and what are your thoughts? And what I was surprised about was that they 
came back to me um, to kind of combat my, you know, uh, productive paranoia, if you will, about what was happening in the market. And both of them said, Mark, what, think supply and demand, do you agree that economics plays a role? Of course, yes, it plays a role in pricing. Okay, so where's this big supply going to come from? Because right now there's no inventory. And I was talking about this pendulum that swings, you know, when a normalized market is around five to six months of inventory on the market. We swung all the way out and I think 2014 was the peak here at around 11 and a half months, almost a full year of inventory on the market. It swung all the way back to like 0.7, so three weeks of inventory on the market. And we're still somewhere around one to 1.2 months of inventory on the market in any of these uh, major metros. And, and so he said, where's the supply of inventory going to come from when you have 90% of the population with an interest rate less than 6%? And probably 50% of the population that has something less than 4%. Like the affordability crisis is not so much that they can't afford the house, but they can't afford to move. And so with fewer houses coming on the market, those that can actually secure inventory and put it on market um, is going to be bullish. And we're certainly seeing that. So to your question, Jimmy, what am I seeing on the market right now? On our flipping inventory in Kansas City, we're seeing multiple offers. We are seeing... Um, you know, zero active listings competing with us. So we're looking at a market and we start off at like a quarter mile radius and then a half mile radius and then a mile radius, which is a lot when you're comping out properties. And then we'll go to two mile radius and we're still seeing no active competition on the market. And so we're thinking, hell, just pop it up 10 grand because if someone wants to move in anytime soon and we're coming into the hottest, you know, market or season, um, you know, of, on an annualized basis. So you know, we are pushing product and we're still getting multiple offers. It's a very, very hot, hot season right now. I just, I keep going back to, you did a phenomenal interview with Bruce Norris last year. And I don't know if you remember, but he essentially said the same thing. He's like, there's a lot of things to look out for with the rising interest rates and whatnot, but this will not be 2008 because there won't be what an appraiser he essentially explained 2008 in the real estate market that an appraiser would go out to a, half, a house and the four houses around it that he was comping were bank owned in foreclosures, right? Yeah. So, of course, homes are going to lose massive values because the appraiser, even though it was, I mean, you were buying back then, it was clear that a house that you were buying at 150, you were like, this is really worth 225, right? Yeah. And so it, that, you know, that's what I've been watching the whole time was straight from Bruce Norris is how much, and I don't mean like interest rates are, uh, I'm sorry, that foreclosures go up 100% because there was zero. So, or there was one, there was one. So now if there's two, that's 100% increase. I'm like, are these really getting the substantial foreclosure numbers? And we're just not there. And so now you, you pile on the interest rate and it's, Bruce Norris also said this in the late seventies and early eighties interest rates doubled and home prices tripled. And I, maybe we'll see that phenomenon again. I don't like to make predictions, but I guess, what, would you agree with this? What we've seen in the last year, this is not an economics 101 class where interest rates go up and housing values go down. Cause that's what you would expect in econ 101. Right. I think there's so many more factors that is not the case at all. So very, I mean, very interesting, very fascinating times. And, I, uh, I'm very grateful that you brought Bruce Norris in last summer to give some sanity to people. Yeah. So let's hit inflation, brother. What are your thoughts on, um, on, uh, inflation in general? Clearly we've got, um, interest rates, um, that continue to rise with inflation to try and combat it. Um, there are some that saying it's under control. Some saying not quite under control. Certainly it's curbed. I don't think it's racing out of control. The latest CPI numbers that, um, will be released, I think on. April 10th um, will indicate that we've, you know, s slowed the steady or this rapid inflationary time period. But what are your thoughts on inflation now? It's going to back the market. I think the way the Federal Reserve has a very blunt instrument, and when you can only solve a problem one way, I always get very nervous. But the Federal Reserve has one instrument, and what to curb inflation? What is it? Interest rates. And I, I just don't think it's going to work. Yeah, they say, uh, what, when, when the only thing you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? <laughs> right. But, so I, I just don't think it's going to work. It's not like the government's curbed its spending. Um, the government hasn't curbed their spending. They're not doing anything to make energy easier and more accessible. So that's going to stay expensive. And then the thing about the bank failures that mystified me 
uh, we I don't we can get into it, but essentially they're going to have to help banks liquidate. They're going to have to create currency to help banks liquidate treasury bonds. So they're just doing what they were doing a couple years ago with free money uh, to everybody. So it's like uh, they're not going to be taking much currency out of the markets. So yeah, as an investor, the greatest threat you have to your future is the losing the buying power of the dollar. And I don't know if it's really going to get curved. When I was talking recently, um, and for those listeners that want to go back and listen, I released a podcast um, a couple of weeks ago with uh, the CEO of a local bank here, uh, Tyler Knott, who's an, a lawyer um, that came back into a family practice that he's, I think, fourth or fifth generation banker. So he's a super smart guy. Um, and I was asking him about the banking failures um, and how that would reverberate around and you know asked him the direct question is this like 2008 and he said it's the exact opposite there are two kinds of bank failures the first kind of bank failure is where you have an asset failure where they've underwritten assets in a or in a uh, poor way or assets have now failed and the bank has to take them back and they start taking massive losses which clearly happened in 2008. this was a liquidity crisis not an not an asset crisis but a liquidity failure and um clearly a run on the bank effectively um that is panic driven and he said the irony is with the media drumming up all of this, um, you know, really was the panic that, that caused the issue. Um, so, you know, his take on it was simply um, he doesn't see any um, catastrophic effect. I asked him if the uh, public would end up bailing out. I thought it was strange. I said, I asked him, what is it the right thing for the Fed to come in and guarantee um, all of these deposits that are well over $250,000 limit? And he actually said, yes, it was. You don't want people to, to lose uh, belief in bank and having, you know, people stash cash under a mattress anymore. So he want, he thought it was valuable, but he said that the public would not be guaranteeing it. It would likely come from FDIC fees. There'd be a, probably a fee raise. You know, think of the FDIC as like an HOA. You know, everyone, everyone's yeah. HOA dues are going to kind of rise up next year. Yeah, but that's where, you know, panic is because it's sharp and acute, right? But, and even a systemic bank run or bank panic would be sharp and acute. But that's the great thing about being able to print money from a government and a banker's perspective is it's a slow burn. And nobody notices until their dollar doesn't buy them anything. Which is why the middle class is getting crushed, right? T tell me about the podcast you listened to this morning about that point. Yeah, so I just, uh, I listened to... Um, Dan Crenshaw, he's a, a former Navy SEAL. He's a congressman from uh, Texas now. And he had a guy, uh, David McCormick. Uh, David McCormick used to be the CEO of uh, Bridgewater. He took over for Ray Dalio. Okay. And he's right. He wrote a new book. And his main, the, or his main thesis is that the middle class, a blue-collar worker, is getting destroyed in America because of inflation. And they have not bought enough assets to keep up with it. And me, as someone who sells cash flowing assets and 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 owns a lot. Hedges, yeah. What's that? And owns a lot of those same assets. And owns a lot. I'm like I've looked at my own wealth grow because the because of inflation and that I own assets. And I'm just like and then uh McCormick was like, well unfortunately no one knew about this. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Hiyosaki went on Oprah in like 1990. Everybody should have known. Everybody knows about this. Yeah. They just don't get, they don't get involved. They don't get started. It's a big issue. Um, I was talking this morning with uh, Tom Caffarella out from, from Boston and his passion right now, passion project is agent investor and uh, talking about the, um, the need for real estate agents to partake. You know, they're stepping over pennies and commissions uh, or stepping over dollars to pick up the pennies on the other side. Um, you know, they all their clients are buying and selling and investing and they have this, the keys to the golden castle, which is the MLS. I mean, how many deals have you found on the MLS, Jimmy? That's where we turn key now. It's a treasure trove, right? right? And well, the I... Go ahead. And the investors that, uh, or, or the real estate agents that are helping these investors, I think his, his take on it is simply, he's trying to encourage other uh, agents to partake in the acquisition of assets because he said, look, you know, my grandfather, um, you know, that they came over to Boston from, um, from Italy 
This is Tommy's story. Uh, his grandfather never made more than minimum wage, but he would save and save and save, and then he would buy an asset. Save and save and save, and buy a duplex. Save and save and save, buy a fourplex. And he just had these, ass these assets that he would continue to, to grow, and he said when he was growing up, his grandfather was the only guy he knew that didn't look like he had a job because he would just be, he'd be he'd work just living off the cash flow from these assets that he was buying. And he was a silent millionaire, the millionaire next door, because, again, didn't make a ton of money, never had a fancy job, but he was smart enough to just put everything he had into assets that would obviously double and triple in value. And what would you... So when you live in a fiat currency, it's not like, oh, I think it's interesting. Maybe I'll buy some assets. It's like, no, you have to buy assets. Uh, you know, my parents are 70 now and they, you know, they, they had a 401k, they did all that, but do you know where they absolutely have crushed it? And the real estate you sold them. And the real estate, like we bought together in 2005, 2006. Nice. And it, and I, what I don't understand is like the people getting devastated right now are people, the retirees, like the bond market's getting crushed. Yeah the stock market's getting crushed and like i don't know why they're not up in arms it, it i'm just like what's going on here but that's what that's how inflation works it's like um uh, it's like boiling a frog he does it if you keep turning the heat up they don't notice you know i'll say it once and say it again i've never met an investor that's 70 years old that wishes he didn't own all that real estate that's in his portfolio well i want to go Let's go back to your book for a second. What were you talking about with the agents? Mm -hmm. Like you make a great claim in your book that marketing wise, the real estate industry is horrible. Where the stock market crushes us is they make it easy that they just can hit the easy button and get involved. Right. Yes. Like I think we're real estate agents, dispo people in wholesale business. I think we're making the critical error that we're just selling features and benefits. We're selling square footage. We're selling bedroom bath. We're not selling to people how these are phenomenal investments and phenomenal assets that can actually hedge against inflation. Right. Well, more than that, it rises with inflation, right? I mean, that's the greatest. Yeah, yeah it benefits through inflation loss. Like, so we were just talking about McCormick and then my other, I, I have a man crush on Ray Dalio. Have you read any of his books? Principles, sure. And well, Pray, do you read a second one? The, no. Uh, Principles for the Changing World Order? No. So the end of the book, do you guess what he said the greatest threat to every investor's portfolio is? The greatest threat to every, and talking about real estate? Well, no, like the greatest threat to every investor in America, what the greatest threat is to their future long-term wealth. Devaluing the dollar? Yeah, inflation. Okay. That essentially the pile of assets that you pile up in securities that don't necessarily... Uh, have all the advantages of real estate, doesn't that that you start liquidating your 401k, you start liquidating your stock portfolio, and it just doesn't buy it up. Well, Ray, Ray's not a real estate guy, though, right? I mean, he's a creating wealth guy. Yeah. So I'm assuming he owns massive amounts of real estate. Yeah. But, And I'm sure Bridgewater has some real estate holdings. Oh, for sure. Bridgewater, if you don't know, is the greatest or uh, the biggest uh, hedge fund right now. So... Assets in general, Jimmy, I don't know how much we, uh, time we need to, to preach. I know our audience is largely invested in real estate, but my goodness, um, you know, the, the, this is, is now that I'll ask you this is now the time to buy. What, what would be your argument for someone saying, well, you know, it's six per six percent interest rates. It's, um, you know, it's the hottest, the highest market that we've ever seen. Why would now be the time to buy? Because every time is a good time to buy. Like, so let's let's take the interest rate argument. Interest rates are high. Do you know who actually benefits when interest rates drop? Landowners. People who already have assets. Yeah. If your plan is to push capital, every time we'd meet at CG in 2020 and 2021, what was our biggest problem? In 2020 and 2021? Yeah. What, inventory? Our biggest frustration was inventory, and then we have millionaires coming to us saying, of a million dollars I'm going to put with you, and we didn't have deals for them. Yeah. So if your plan is to only invest when interest rates are low, you will not be able to push your capital through that strong. You need to strategically, you need to strategically, and I'm trying to think of another, really just strategically. Systematically, right? Like consistently. Yeah. 
strategic and systematically buy assets so that when there is the next disaster and the Fed does blast lower interest rates, blast them to zero, then you refi everything out. And then I don't where, uh, the question I got for you, uh, where would you put any of your money right now? New construction and multifamily and, and uh, you know, good quality. Outside of real estate. Outside oh. of real estate, where would you put? I, I, I haven't even given that any thought. That's literally how, how little I, I, I respect the, the stock market, right? Well, yeah, you've been talking about the stock market being frothy for years at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So, you, you know, you invest in the stock market. Okay, maybe you get appreciation. You get no tax benefits. Can't use leverage. And it really doesn't cash flow. No. Why don't I, we try crypto? Let's try crypto, Mark. That sounds fun. Stay speak shit. Yeah, can you even do that anymore? I don't know what's still available. No, it's crazy. Yeah, look, I, I Jimmy, I was you'd be interested. I, I um, went down a rabbit hole uh, late at night uh, at my computer on the MLS and ended up recording an actual video that was way too long-winded and uh, rambly, but I just sent it to my team and said, use this somehow. But... I started looking and I did one of those screen share recordings and I started looking, okay, I think we've sold like, you know, 33 assets in the last two months. So we started looking at those 33 assets that we sold this year and said, you know what, MLS has got just the ones we sold in the MLS, like MLS has got pretty good data. Let's go back and see what, you know, what it sold for previously. So I just said, okay, we sold it for 250. Oh, I could have bought this 10 years ago for 125. Here, it sold for 180. Oh man, it sold for 90,000 20 years ago. Doubled in value. Like consistently, something that we sold for 450, oh, it sold for 225 20 years ago. Like doubled in value every 20 years, at a minimum. There was some that doubled in value in the last 10 years. It is so, like I'd always say, real estate doubles in value every 20 to 30 years. I think I'm going to stop saying 30 because consistently we are seeing uh, real estate double in value every 20 years in the Kansas City marketplace. And I just can't, you know, just, I just wish more people would, would listen and, and take action. I think that's, that's the biggest right. fallacy. And now it's happening. Mark Delator saying about it alone in his underwear in the middle of the night, looking at the MLS, like that's aggregate data throughout the United States that you even do include the crash, a house that you would buy in 2022, if you had bought it in 20, in 2002 doubled in value. Yes, exactly. And uh, yep. went through the crash survived all then. I was talking with an investor, uh, you know, a investor couple that um, retired dentists. They just moved from California, shocking, to uh, Nevada. They, they, they migrated, weird. Um, and they sold their house and they said, yeah, yeah, we'd lived there for 29 years. And I'm like, can I just ask a question? Did it triple in value? They said, no, a little better than that. <laughs> you know, right. 29 years, it more than tripled in value. And then they were able to buy something like significantly, uh, just as nice, but significantly less than wherever they moved to in Nevada. But um, yeah, it's just, it's consistent across the board. And everyone's giggling, thinking that they do well because it's on their single family home. And oh, I'm so smart. I bought it right. It's like, no, that, you know, what about doing it 10 times or 20 times or 30 times? That would be smart. Right. Not in just a single if family. The government resident. gives you the opportunity to do, do it 20 times. Like, I am adamant about this. It is your American right. It is your patriotic duty to get 20 of these loans. 10 from your spouse and 10 from you, right? Correct. The golden tickets. Talk to me about that. You, you, you always call these the golden tickets. Why do you call these the golden tickets? What's so good about a Fannie Mae conforming mortgage is what you're talking about, right? Yeah. You're a pretty good businessman, right? You do okay, right? I'm okay. Let's say let's let's say that banker you had on your show. Yeah. You wanted to uh, let's say you put your financials down on his on his desk and be like, hey, uh, hi Mike, I'd like to go buy some assets, and I want like a thirty-year fixed mortgage rate. What is he going to say to you? We don't offer that product to anyone. No one accepts. If you and Sarah Bath just said, hey, I want to go buy another house. I want 30-year fixed mortgage. Then he would give it to you. On a personal residence only. Yep. No. I, some of your, you could do 19 other investment properties. Oh, you're, say, many, you're saying if I went to the government and asked them. No, I'm saying as long as you don't go in as a businessman. Like, it's absurd. It's absurd that they give homeowners better 
rates, better loans than business people. Right. And hey, you know, I'm not going to like try to change the government. Can't beat them, join them. But this is government subsidized loans with a fixed interest rate over 30 years. It doesn't matter what the rate is. It just matters that it's fixed. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a topic that we go into a lot because I think some of our investors um, are discouraged when they see that the fees are a little bit higher. And I say, it doesn't matter. You're paying for the benefit of fixing for 30 years. So if you truly hold, and again, you know, I think most, you know, there's for single family homeowners that, that live in their home for, I think the average, what is the average length of residency in your existing home? Like seven years or something? Maybe it's going a lot longer now. Maybe it's up to eight years, but, um, you know, so you'd argue you don't need to fix that, but for an investment property that you're going to buy and hold forever, which again, the best exit strategy is when they put you in the ground, they, they, you deed these assets to your children. Um, so if you're going to buy and hold these assets forever for the long term, then the smartest thing that you can do is lock in a 30 year fix to get these things paid off. I just, I don't know what else you could be doing at, as if for an investment vehicle. And I, you know, I know everybody gets all Dave Ramsey scared about leverage, but if leverage is a fixed rate, it's really hard to fail with it. I did an Instagram reel. You mentioned Dave Ramsey. I just um, saw him post um, the other day. Oh, I, I saw it this morning. That's I, I'm copying your social right now. Did you like that one? I did. Dude, Dave is adamant. He said, real estate is not going down. Simple supply and demand, right? I mean, there's no supply. Wait, that, do, you, do you think for the audience, you could maybe talk a little bit about what's going on with home builders? Yeah, well, so home builders, um, you know, are in a unique position because now we're 12 years long in the tooth um, of a bull run. And a lot of them that survived 2007, uh, 8, and 9, when the crash happened, um, have a lot of scar tissue. And so they have not, most home builders have not been aggressively scaling and growing based on what they fear could be another downturn. Um, but the interesting thing about new construction is that from the, the five previous decades, you know, from the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s up to 2010 when the crash happened, the average new construction was somewhere around 25 million units out of the ground every year. So then that's kind of a baseline to for new construction to support the, the growth in population in America. So again, nationwide statistics, we're not regional now. So 25 million. Well, from 2000, 2009, we have this global financial crisis and, and new construction just got pummeled. And so for that entire, and took so long to recover that for the entire decade of 2010 to 19, there was only 5.6 million homes built. So now we hit 2020, we're two years in, we have to not only get back to our existing level of 25 million homes built, but also try and recover the 20 million that should have been built in the decade prior. So Jimmy, new construction is so needed right now. I think people think that there is some speculative nature in what these new builders are doing, but quite frankly, I think that inventory is still so shallow, especially in the big cities that are, that are experiencing massive population growth, which is why I love being in Kansas city, you know, Omaha, St. Louis, Kansas City, um, and Des Moines, like the middle of America where we're seeing the migra net positive migration from the, you know, the, the flight of the, the blue collar, or not blue collar, but the blue states um, and on the east, on, the, on all the coasts and, and natural migration patterns and obviously the, uh, the uh, increase in population base through birth uh, that we're seeing. We're seeing some massive population growth to the big cities like Kansas City that are sucking people in. And new construction is just booming. And so, but now have the interest rates affected new home or home builders that much? It's slowed down for the the sales of new homes for sure. Um, but they are actually now like uh, we're working with a couple of new home builders um, in some projects that we're doing, and he said that they are right on budget for for where they anticipated um, you know their their sales to be. Um, they're using smaller spivs. Um, clearly, that it was slow. Like like everybody, um, when you say normalizing market that we're in right now, clearly it was, um, yeah, very bleak in two thousand uh, in uh, twenty twenty two. Call it Q three, Q four. Like everyone's yeah. like the way that they 
you know, I, I, the way I talk about it is that the government, um, you know, really has one layer of interest rates, right? So they were only going with the accelerator and they didn't have a break. So they had to just slam their foot on the brake by so quickly raising interest rates that it, um, everyone came to a, a, an absolute stop. Um, but now we've kind of normalized, we're getting back to a normal market. Um, and that's where I think new home builders are actually seeing some pretty decent sales now coming into what's going to be their busiest time. Okay. It's just because a new home builder business is a little more interest rate sensitive because they got from the the time they break ground till they sell the house. How long of uh, well, how long is that turn? Yeah, five or six months for most builders. Okay, but it definitely interest rates rising are definitely going to do nothing to help overcome that housing show. No, it's not. Um, I will also argue though too that um, the cost of construction. Uh, that they got beat up on in 2001 and beginning of 2022 has now come down and normalized where they're now getting fair rates of lumber and fair rates of vinyl siding and fair rates of, you know, material supplies. So they're actually, you know, maintaining profitability, um, at least the builders that I'm talking to. Gotcha. Cool. I didn't, I didn't know any of that. So that I like to come on podcast and learn. You got it. Jimmy, anything else before we wrap? Um... I think we, uh, I think we, no, I think we kind of hammered everything. The only thing you had mentioned, turnkey providers getting a bad rap. I don't know if you want to go into that at all, but um, well, yeah, let's let's do that real quick. Rodney Dangerfield, where do you see the uh, similarities here? <laughs> well, I just, I'm gonna start it off with a knock knock joke. Are you ready? I'm ready. So knock knock, who's there? Orange. Orange who? Orange are glad you didn't invest in any of those banks in Silicon Valley that just went under. Amen. I, just, <laughs> I feel like everybody is trying to get away around the inevitable that you have to buy these boxes of commodities if you want to build wealth. Like yeah. they experiment with crypto. Because when the market was hot in 2020, you know, people who were diehards of the stock market were like laughing at us, right? Yep. So then in crypto, they're like, no, real estate's boring. I'm going to do crypto. And it's like, okay, now I'm going to buy treasury bonds. And treasury bonds are leading to liquidity crisis with banks. And it's just like, we're just like, we're kind of like Rodney Dangerfield. And then, you know, those those uh, movies in the 90s where, like, the girl would be attracted to the foot, the quarterback on the football team. And there was a nice guy with glasses. And Football player was a jerk. <laughs> yeah, the girl would date the football player, and he turned out to be a jerk. But then... Uh, the guy would take off his glasses and he turned out to be super handsome. Maybe he got some, uh, acne pills or whatever, and he turned out to be super handsome and he was always there. So I think us as turnkey providers, that's who we are. We're not the quarterback. We we're get always no, there. We get no respect. Exactly. <laughs> that's fair. Um, you know, the challenge now, honestly, for all turnkey providers in the, in the country, I think is going to be inventory. Um, you know, we're getting a lot of people knocking on our door and quite frankly, um, yeah, I don't know how much inventory we're going to be able to sell. I would love to just open up the doors and say, yeah, come buy as much as you want. But the the challenge for a turnkey provider is that you have to have the raw materials, which is the ugly house that you turn into a pretty house to be able to turnkey that asset or build it from scratch. So, um, you know, it's going to be a challenge over the next coming years to uh, consistently deliver the volume of turnkey assets that that we certainly have demand for. What are your thoughts? Well, well, if it's easy, everybody be doing it. Yeah. So I, it's like I think we're going to come on this this podcast four times a year, and we're just going to talk about the next challenge that's in front of us. Like I don't think we're, I don't think there'll ever be a podcast where like, man, things have gotten so easy. Mark, great <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Wouldn't make for a good audience viewership or uh, or listening for sure. Well, it'd also make for a boring day. That yeah. We have to whine about. Dude, we got a lot to we got a lot to be grateful for. Hey, we've got to stop uh, st end with some gratitude. Um, grateful for your time, Jimmy. As always, thank you for joining me on the show. Thank you for your commitment to the Collector Genius, which I enjoy serving uh, in that in that space with you. Um, thank you for your friendship and uh, your leadership uh, again in Guatemala. As my children really enjoyed getting to spend some time. There is, I, I found a new pleasure getting to compare my supplement routine with a 17 year old. That was a, another awesome thing about hanging out with Jackson. He's a beast. He, uh, he loves his workout routine and, and certainly got inspired by hanging with you too. 
Yeah, dude's getting huge. So, but yeah, thank you for all that. I, I feel the exact same way. So thanks, Mark. All right. So for all you Rise Up Live Free listeners and your mistake-free real estate podcast listeners, thanks so much. Remember to like, subscribe, and uh, hit up our channel as well as Jimmy's so that you don't miss any of our content coming forward. Thanks for joining us today. You're listening to Mistake Free Real Estate Radio, the authority in passive real estate investing. No late night calls, no clogged drains, no tenant nightmares. Take the passive investor's approach to real estate investing and trust a turnkey professional. Learn more at mistakefreerealestate.com. Until next time, remember, you don't get rich from what you earn, you get rich from what you own.